Hey everyone, this is your host, Andrew Holland. Thank you so much for listening to the Andrew Holland Podcast each and every week, where we talk about business, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. As an entrepreneur who's been through a lot of highs and a lot of lows, I started this podcast to be a source of weekly motivation, inspiration, and support for all of us who are working to achieve something meaningful. And as importantly, so that none of us ever have to feel alone or isolated while we're doing so. Together, we explore the stories of successful people. We get insight and advice from individuals who have accomplished amazing things. We discuss practical and fascinating business models and strategies, and we dive deep into understanding ourselves as human beings. So please help me grow our group and subscribe to the show on your favorite audio platform. Subscribe to, watch, and thumbs up our episodes on our YouTube channel, The Andrew Holland Podcast. Follow and interact with me on Twitter and threads. My handle is A Holland Podcast. That's A Holland Podcast. That's probably my favorite part of the whole podcast is the interaction I get with our guests and with you as our listeners. Lastly, if you enjoy the show and you want to support what we're working to accomplish, please share our show with your friends, with your family, and your colleagues at work. This show is nothing without you and your support. And I'm so incredibly thankful for each and every one of you listening, watching, and sharing the podcast every single week. Now it's time to get our motivation, inspiration, and support for this week and jump into today's episode. In today's episode, Shannon Inukai Kafi, a successful entrepreneur in the automotive industry, shares with us her family story. Starting with one small location with her great-grandfather, who was a mechanic, and moving to her father, who got into the dealership industry, eventually owning his own shop, losing it, and then starting all over again, ultimately growing to a multi-location dealership in the state of Oregon, Shannon shares with us some incredible insight, advice, and wisdom, ranging from being in business with family, the struggles and the rewards that that comes with, from being in a volatile industry that's incredibly dependent on consumer spending and interest rates, all the way up to how important and transformational reading great business books can be for every entrepreneur. I really enjoyed sitting down with Shannon, and I think you'll love the conversation that she shared with us in studio. While Andrew Holland is a CPA, a real estate broker, and involved in multiple businesses, including some investment companies, the Andrew Holland podcast is for informational purposes only. All of Andrew's views and those of his guests are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of any of the businesses or companies Andrew or his guests are affiliated with. You should not treat any advice, conversation, business recommendation, investment recommendation, or anything of the like as a specific inducement to make a specific business decision, take a a specific action, make a particular investment, or follow a specific business or investment strategy. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the show. Thank you so much for joining us today, Shannon, and welcome to the Andrew Holland Podcast. Thanks for having me. So you have a really interesting and motivating story from your father to you to your brother. But take us back. How did you become an entrepreneur? How did you get into the car business? Give us some background so our listeners can get a good idea of the foundation that you had growing up. I mean, I think part of it was just necessity for, born out of necessity. I I needed a job. Sure. So trying to figure out, I wasn't one of those lucky individuals that, you know, growing up, it was like, oh, I always wanted to be this, or I always want, you know, some people just know they have a passion, they know, I, you know, I didn't have that. So you were born and raised where? In Oregon. In Oregon. So okay. In Oregon. Okay. And um, my dad was always in the car business. And I mean, honestly, I don't know that that's something that I thought, oh, I always want to be in the car business. But I ended up going to work for my dad, needed a job, and I really liked working with him. And so when we, I was his assistant, I worked in the office, I did a lot of stuff around the dealership. Did he have and... you in there at like 10, 11? <laughs> All right. Come on, Shannon, you're you coming know, to work with me. When I was a kid, I would go into the dealership with him, and that was when stamps didn't 
where they weren't sticky. So you had to like either lick them or you had to like put water on them. <laughs> and so he would give me like these stacks of, you know, accounts receivables or whatever to mail. Yes. And so I would do that or my brother and sister would be there or he would have me file or just random have me go get food for people. We would walk around. I mean, just Hillsboro at the time was a small town. So Hillsboro, Oregon. Hillsboro, Oregon. Okay. Small town outside of Portland. Um, that's where he started his his business originally. And so he would take us to work on Saturdays or I would go with him like in the summer and just do odd jobs around the dealership. So always spent time in and around the dealership, kind of my whole life. So I, I find that's a common theme with everybody that we talk to. They're a lot of times become an entrepreneur because either it's all they've known, which it sounds like right. you, when was, your yes. parents are growing up, that's you, or they discover later on, you know, I'm different than a lot of people who want to work for someone else and they want to run or lead something. So tell me about your father. How did he get into dealerships? Give us a little background about your parents, both of your parents, and then we'll get into how you got into the dealership like you just talked about and then how things proceeded from there. So my grandpa, my dad's dad, he was a mechanic. So he had a gas station, worked on cars. It was really a service station, you know, back then. Yeah. Um, he, was, he was the kind of person that he liked to help people. So, and he was always known for that. People would come in, their car was broke, you know, he would help them and they would have him work on their cars for years and years and years. And that was just a thing with him. Yeah. Amazing customer service. And amazing customer service. He's, he believed in that so much. He just, it was all from his heart. And so my dad was around cars all the time. And I think cars were a total passion for this him. This is in Oregon. In Oregon. That's, what, all that's in where Oregon. your dad was. Okay. So um, <clears throat> my dad was actually born in a Japanese internment camp during the war. Really? So my grandparents, because we lived, um, they lived in Oregon. They were, um, they were interned um, in um, Tule Lake, California, and then in um, Minidoka, Idaho. So they were forced to live in an internment camp in World War II. Yes. Yes, and that's where my dad and my aunt were both born. And then after the war, when they were released, basically, um, they ended up back in Oregon, made their way from um, Ontario back to Hood River, and then back to Portland eventually, where my um, grandpa opened a service station. Okay. And then, um, yeah, so my dad was always around cars. Yeah. And I think that was something that he it was just a passion for him. And I think after he met my mom and they got married and, um, you know, got pregnant with me, he sort of decided, okay, you know, he was in, he was doing insurance, I think. And, um, they to make found, ends meet. Yep. Okay. Yep. Doing yeah. insurance. And so he ended up going to work for Ron Tonkin, who was a very, um, respectable car dealer and family in Oregon and spent a lot of years there sort of working for him, learning, learning his craft. And I think he loved it. He was really good at it. I think he, um, you the know, sales side, the business side, the the mechanic side, or I all of it. I think kind of all of it. You know, he had all the elements. So very charismatic. Had that same really passion for people and customers, the same way my grandpa did. My grandma was very much that way. She was a waitress her whole life, so she loved people. Very hardworking That's individuals. So awesome. Um, so he loved that he had the, he had the mechanic side, you know, from growing up around my grandpa and in the service station, he had the customer service piece, which you need sort of across the dealership. Um, he was a great salesperson. So he loved, he just was great at it. Yeah. Um, I think when you love people and you want to help them, that part just was kind of a natural for yeah. him. And then I think the leadership part just was in him and he was able to foster that. And I think, um, you know, the people that worked with him saw that in him also. And that so, was a natural gift he had was the leadership. People yep. wanted to follow him. I think that was a total natural thing that he had. And I think, you know, in our business as I was coming up, I think my brother totally had that from my dad as well. And that was just, just that really charismatic kind yeah. of personality that makes people want to be around them. Yeah. So 
Um, well, and don't sell yourself short. You have that same thing. I know you talked a lot about your brother, but that's why you guys were successful to, together, which we'll get into their car dealership. So your dad worked at Ron Tonkin. Ron Tonkin. Ron Tonkin. Yep. Okay. And he have one dealership, multiple dealerships. At the time, I think he, um, I think he, I don't, you know, I think he just had the one store back in sort of the sixties and I could okay. be wrong about that, but he, um, it was a very big, um, Chevrolet store at okay. the time. Chevy. And he worked there, um, it's probably until the late seventies, early mid seventies. And then he got his first opportunity to buy into another store. So he was in his thirties or th yeah, early thirties when he got his, um, the first opportunity to buy into another dealership. This is your dad. Yes. That's young. I was young. I really young, especially you know? being able to buy into a dealership. Yep. And so That's he. Awesome. Did that with Jim Fisher, um, another really well-known, um, you know, car car dealer in Portland, Oregon. Very successful. So um, if anybody is from Portland, Oregon, they've heard they, these names. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as far as dealerships, and, yeah. and they were, you know, very involved in just the dealership industry and, um, you know, in Portland for sure. Yeah. And still active today. Those, those names are still familiar yeah. in Portland to this day. That's a lasting legacy. Yes. So, um, he so buys a dealership in his thirties. Yep. So he was partners. He was a partner okay. and then he got an opportunity to buy his own store out in Hillsboro. And so that was really his own. Um, he was in Hillsboro. Uh, it was a single point Dodge store that he bought from, from a family. And that was, that was sort of where I, I mean, I had been in the other dealerships, obviously, too, yeah. but spent more time probably out there in Hillsboro. How did that opportunity come up? And the reason I ask that is a lot of, especially young people today <clears throat> who have identified themselves as entrepreneurs. And I talk about this a lot on the podcast, that I, I'm a big believer that there are four types of individuals. There are people that are born entrepreneurs, and they know that, and they try it. There are people that aren't born entrepreneurs, and they know that, and they don't try it. There are people that aren't born entrepreneurs and they try it and it find they find out it's not for them. And then the last group, which is really what this podcast is all about, it, it, entrepreneurs who know they're entrepreneurs, of course, but people who are born entrepreneurs, but they never discover that or don't give themselves the opportunity to discover that either because of fear or because of risk or because... Um, they don't have the confidence or they don't have the role models around them to identify those traits, or they don't have someone like you had your dad growing up who was just an entrepreneur. And so that's all you knew. And so you obviously are an entrepreneur and you learned that at a very young age. So for your dad, it sounds like he was born an entrepreneur and he knew he was an entrepreneur, but how did this opportunity to become his own boss, so to speak, come about? Um, so let's see. I, you know, I think for the auto industry, it was so much different back then, right? I mean, it's, I mean, like many industries, yeah. it's just changed so much. And I think um, back then, you know, the factory and still today, they they were always looking for people. And I think my dad was probably one of those standout people. Now, factually, I don't know exactly how that all came about, sure. how that opportunity, but because he was somebody that worked hard, had good relationships with, you know, people that worked from the factory, people that worked at banks, other dealerships, because, and, and that's still probably somewhat true to this day, 100%. With that, you know, the relationships are obviously very important. Yeah. Um, I think that that's how he got those opportunities and then you know, was able to pursue them because he, um, because he had that, he had that drive, you know, he had that ambition to do that. Yeah. I think that's an excellent lesson for all of us and, and for everyone listening. If you want to be an entrepreneur, but you don't know how to become an entrepreneur, people notice if you're working in the corporate world or if you're, no matter where you're working, people take notice of individuals that care that they have a good, solid, ethical foundation that not care because they have to, but they genuinely care uh, for other people, just about everything, society in general, the country in general. And it's funny you say that because I got my first opportunity in the financial services industry because I worked at Burger King for four straight years, 14 through 18. 
And it just so happened that I was almost always in drive through And the branch manager of a large financial institution in the area came through every, almost every day getting coffee. And when I turned 18, she said, do you want to work in the financial services industry? And at that point, I was ready to move on. And that's really how I got anywhere is because of just treating people like treat people want to be treated in a fast food restaurant. Yeah. I mean, hard work, it's hard it's it's hard to beat hard work. It is. Right? I mean, it really is. Yeah. And so I think that that was a lot of his, was just he had drive, he had, had ambition. I mean, and he was given that opportunity because people saw, saw People that. identified it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the brightest. Hard work. Hard work wins every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Yeah. So he buys the dealership. Do you remember him buying the dealership? Were you around at that time I, or not? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um... I do remember him buying the dealership. So we, at the time, lived in um, Oregon City or Beaver Creek, which is a small little town. And Hillsboro was really far away. I mean, at the time, I think it was probably, you know, it was probably 45 minutes to an okay. hour away. Pe people didn't do a lot of commuting. So that was, he was gone a lot. And oh, so, so you guys the, lived in? We lived in Oregon City. The dealership was in Hillsboro. Oh, Okay. So it was a bit of a strain for our family. Yeah. And like a lot um, of businesses are. It's yeah. It just, he, so he was gone a lot. You know, I mean, it was something he loved what he did. So he always said, you know, love what you do. It's, it's, it's kind of a cliche, but if you love what you do, you don't ever work a day it's in your so life. True. Right? It yeah. is, and that's how he felt about the business. And um, so at the time, you know, he, he, had, he bought the business. It was in a small town. He, you know, but it was a tough, um, it was a tough time for Dodge Chrysler. And, um, you know, a, a number of years later, they, you know, they kind of went under, you know, everybody kind of, everybody kind of went away. Yeah. I, this was what the 80s? So it would have been like 1979. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole country was Yep. All the stuff was, mess. yep. Yeah. And, um, it was right before, was before Lee Iacocca took, took over. Yeah. Right. And so, um, he ended up losing the business. Um, he, he, um, he had bought property in Hillsboro. So we had this, pro uh, you know, property in Hillsboro. Um, he leased that out to somebody else. He ended up going back to work for, um, Ron Tonkin, um, like many, many Dodge dealers around the country yeah. that this had happened to. So fast forward a few years. I mean, and I think that when you think about being entrepreneurial, a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of the risk and the failure and sort of doing it over again. It there, that's, that's always part of a success story. I think that's, there's always that. It's funny you say that because I've studied so many um, wealthy individuals that we know now and almost, I, I'm not even sure if any of them are excluded mm -hmm. that that's a part of their story, either facing bankruptcy or yeah. fluttering with bankruptcy, because I think, you know, he's 30, so he's relatively young. He buys a dealership and he knows, he knows a lot about the car dealership, but running a business and having employees and in his scenario, being tied to a larger organization right. that probably there's nothing he could do. Right. Um, and then of course Lee comes in and saves them. There's a great documentary on the history channel about uh, the car industry and the cars that built America. Mm -hmm. And they talk all about this time period yes. of Dodge and Chrysler. It's fantastic. You guys have heard me talk about uh, these documentaries, the men that built America. Well, there's one that's the cars that built America and it talks about this time frame and how he talks about the minivan and the caravan. Oh right? yeah. Oh. That's what saved their yes, it <laughs> saved does. The business. And, and it talks about how Lee Iacocca really was born from <clears throat> being rejected by senior leadership at other, um, I don't remember whether it was Chevy, Ford. Ford, it was Ford. Yeah, and Ford. he had a passion to, for cars, but to get back or to, to get vengeance. And so he comes and it's awesome. But yes. to your point, so many people are afraid of failing when really in, in you have to embrace failure and realize that's just part of it. And it, mm -hmm. if you have the perseverance, uh, like your dad did, like you and your brother did, and we'll get to 2008 and 2009, which you've shared with me before, yeah. <laughs> if you have the perseverance and don't let that moment in time define the rest of your future, 
the opportunity set is tremendous. And so your dad did that. He totally did that. So one of the things that he used to always say was that because, so we had a lot of, um, at the time without getting into too much minutia, but at the time, if you, um, financed a car with a bank, um, the dealership basically guaranteed that loan. And so any of this outstanding money that was happening, um, when his business failed, um, he was really on the hook for all of that. And, um, a lot of people in that same situation, like you said, they declared bankruptcy or they just walked away. There was a lot of that. Well, my dad, he paid it all back. And so it took him a lot of years to do that. A lot of, you know, stuff. So he worked, he was a really hardworking guy, right? So he was really, um, you know, it really mattered to him. He was really proud of that fact that he did that because a lot of people didn't do that during they that time. They just walk away. They just walk away, right? And he didn't want to stiff anybody. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want that sort of attached to his name. And I think he, you know, he knew that that wasn't the end, right? And so because he did that, he, when it all started coming back around, he had this property And he had an opportunity to get another, to get the franchise back. That's fantastic. And so that's totally what happened. So then the first, what I really consider the first real, you know, so the the dealership or whatever, Dick's Country Dodge in Hillsboro, that was the dealership that he um, went back into. And it opened um, like December of the 1981. Okay. So it wasn't a ton. It's not a lot of years had gone, gone by. Yeah. Um. So, but that was really... And Dick, of course, is your dad. Yep. 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 And that's really where it all happened. That was the beginning of sort of Dick's auto group, which is what um, I would say my brother and I ended up sort of, you know, calling our business. That's what my brother is still, you know, the the head of Dick's auto group. Okay. So tell us about that. So about how old are you when this, when he gets his first uh, named dealership in 81, 82, plus or minus? Are you in... I high was school, in high you... school. Okay, so you're yep. in high school. So you're very aware school. of everything that's going on and everything yes. that's happened over the past three or four years. Yes. And now you're involved yes. in the business. You're growing up in cars. Tell us, um, high school, did you, college, did you go to college? Where did you go to college? Or did you jump right into the business? Give us that background and then I... kind of take us to 2008, 2009. Yeah, so just I, um, I, 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 didn't, I did go to college but I wasn't successful that first, that first go around. And so I ended up going to work for my dad Okay, and I was working in the office, sort of learning the business, um, doing, it, it was kind of one of those things. I started out doing a lot of odd jobs, mm-hmm. just working whenever he needed me. And then no he, favoritism because you were the owner's daughter. No, I would say definitely the opposite the, yep. of favoritism. <laughs> that, that's exactly, and that's the way it should be. And I've heard you know, in so many scenarios it is very challenging to be the son or daughter of the owner because oh my Lord, yes. it, it's a million times harder. So Definitely. far for the yeah. course. No favoritism. My dad did not believe in that. Uh, but at one point he basically said, you know, if you're going to do this and you're not going to go to school, then, you know, full-time job, sort of eight to five, this is your job. And so I started working in the office. So okay. that was my, really my first real job. And I was, I was 21. Um, at the time. And, so you're still figuring um, life out like we all are at 21, trying yes. to decide, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? Uh, yes. It, it yeah. takes us guys <laughs> even longer, trust me. But <laughs> So did you like it? Did you hate it? Was it just a job? What was your mindset you know, at the time? I liked it. It was, um, I had never, like I said, I didn't really know what I wanted to be mm-hmm. or do. And when I started there, I was learning something new kind of every day. And Mm -hmm. I felt being the daughter or being a family member, you all, I always felt, um, a sense of, you know, sort of vested interest. There is a different sense of responsibility. hundred percent. I think if, if you're part of a family business and you don't have that, that can be what can really create issues for people. Certainly. And so I think that just, I, for whatever reason I had that, you know, my dad and I were close. Um, I think, uh, you know, I wanted to do, I wanted to do good. Yeah. You know, I wanted to like, well, you want to please your father, but you also, your name is on the line. Like this is, 
your name yes, and your dad's name, the whole family name. Yes. Now your brother, are are you older or younger than your brother? Older. You're older. Okay. So yeah. then your brother is how much younger is he than you? He's four years younger than me. Okay. So he comes into the business at some point as well. Yes. Um, and tell us how it matriculates that you guys end up owning the business. Well, you know, we didn't, we, we, the three of us worked to, together for a number of years and all of it, it was, it was hard. It was hard when Scott and I were younger, when my dad was still alive. There's a lot of father son stuff. There's just a brother sister stuff. Yep. There's it, it was hard for a number of those years. And um, we, we spent time and really my brother and I did too. We spent time with a, um, a family business therapist to sort of make that better. That's fantastic. And, uh, I would highly recommend that for anybody that works in a family business. Cause it's, you know, the, the, he would, Dr. Ron would always say, you know, you want to be able to work together, but you also want to be able to have Thanksgiving together. Yeah. And I think a lot of family businesses have trouble with that. And it's, um, I mean, and I get it. It, it's, it. it can be really challenging. Oh, I, so Shannon, we met because Caleb and I own a construction company. Caleb, my brother, he's been on here before. And we met through the construction company. And that's part of the reason that your story resonated so much with me and to all of our listeners It will because people get this idea, oh, let's go into business with family or with friends. And they don't realize being in business, period, it doesn't matter who it is is challenging right, right now you're with someone it doesn't matter uh, you know significant other spouse brother sister mother aunt uncle it, it doesn't matter what it is now you basically conjoin people's lives a hundred percent of the time and i don't care anybody spending a, almost a hundred percent of the time together i don't care if you're blood related or not is bound to kill each other or want to at some point and so i like that you guys were proactive and it wasn't, you know, I think in this day, day and age, it's, it's less of a faux pas. Oh, you're seeing a therapist or yeah, that's true. I, I, it's, it's back then it was probably more like, I don't know why it was so like frowned upon. I think we have gotten to a better place in society where it's like, don't try to hide your weaknesses or pretend like something doesn't exist. That's obviously there. Find a solution for it. Um, and I think hearing people like you who have become incredibly successful say that was a big part of why we are successful helps even people that today have that stigma still attached to them. And I still believe some businesses have that, whether it's family related or not, mm -hmm. but I love that you still know Dr. Ron's name and you can oh, give yeah. the advice that he gave. And I think that's, that's good advice for our listeners. Number one, don't be afraid to ask for help. It, you know, it, it can be anybody that can, often just have an outside perspective um, because as you guys, I'm sure identified in a family business, um, there's a stronger bond than the business itself. And often sometimes we are more honest with those we are closest to and perhaps treat them less um, respectfully than we might a stranger or something of that nature. I mean, that's just human nature, right? Those who we love the most are most comfortable with. We yes. tend to let ourselves show during the hardest times. And so uh, I think that's a reflection of you know when you can be honest, but sometimes you need an outside perspective from that. I mean, it's an interesting thing when you think about you know your family role, because every in every family, no matter how big or how small, you have a role that you play. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm the oldest child. If you're the youngest, the oldest, the girl, the boy, whatever, you have those roles. Yep. And then when you get into business, it's really easy for those same roles to play out, and the, it might not be what's best for the business, yeah. right? So that's an excellent it's a, point. Shannon. You know, I think for us personally, I think when we our family roles were one thing and then they totally were different in our business. And it through the help with Dr. Ron, we were able to sort of take on those different roles in the business, which helped us to be successful yeah. because had we kept our same roles, like sort of from our family, me being the oldest, the sister, all of that, that wasn't what, what was best for our business. And so it's interesting 
I just think it's interesting how those dynamics come play out. That's so, a fantastic perspective because I never even thought about it like that. And the way you just so succinctly put it, and maybe that's why, you know, that's such great. I did to me, I've been in family owned businesses. I've been in non, I never even thought about it like that way, that way, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That's you see all those things about, you know, the oldest child, this is their role, or, <laughs> you know, the middle child, what their role, you know what yep. I mean? And yep. so, but in business it's different. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to, you have to sort of break out of that. And we were lucky enough to be able to do that. And I think that's what served us so well as times in the business got hard because um, there was a period of time when my brother left the business. And so it was just my dad and I. So is this 2008, <clears throat> 2000? Give yeah, us that perspective sort of when things that, were hard. Yeah, sort of in that probably, I think he left maybe in 2005 Okay. Um, to pursue some other, other interests still in the car business, but mm-hmm. not with the family. Things had gotten hard. And so it was my dad and I, and I think we were definitely, you know, in those family roles in when it was just my dad and I in the Mm -hmm. business and it was, we were not having success Mm -hmm. and we were really struggling. And when my brother came back in 2009, um, he, he really helped us. He helped us, you know, sort of see things differently. I think maybe his his perspective had always been different, but I think leaving the business, the yeah. family business, certainly gave him a new perspective and appreciation for other businesses, how they run their businesses and appreciation for our own family business. And it really helped us to build new trust, a, a totally new relationship that was different from sort of that family role place that we had started as kids from, you know, yeah. when we were, when we just sort of both were starting in the business. Um, and I think that that really helped us forge a new, a new sort of foundation yeah. um, for our relationship and the business. I love how you said it, he had, he had a different perspective, but going outside of the family business gave him a different perspective that he could bring to you guys. And I think that's like anything in life, right? When you're having trouble or that's why I'm such a uh, voracious reader. And I love to have this talk to other people who have been through this before, because just like you talked about the different roles and family and business, and maybe those aren't the right roles. It's all about perspective and it helps you learn and say, you know what, if we did that, we would solve this, this, and this problem. And so your brother did that by leaving the business. And it sounds like that happened because, you know, maybe, um, things got to a heightened point where it's bend or break. And mm-hmm. I, that anybody that says they haven't experienced that, whether in a personal relationship, in a professional relationship or business, well, they're either, you know, angels or they're lying. And so <laughs> I, I tend to believe it's the second one because no, no human's an angel, but that's what the business needed. Him going away gave him a perspective and you guys wouldn't have been able to be as successful had that, you know, those tough times resulted in that, him getting a different perspective and coming back and then you guys rejoining and realizing, wow, this is what we need to do. Yeah. I mean, it was really, I I, I was for sure at a breaking point. I mean, as you recall, 2008, 2009, you know, our, the economy was tough. Things were, things were difficult. Mm-hmm. We had two dealerships at the time. We probably had, you know, a hundred and... 20 ish employees, maybe a wow. few less than that, but across the two dealerships, um, my dad and I were not getting along at the time. Um, I mean, you know, it was just, I, it just was stressful. Business was just a really, yeah. really hard. Well, the economy, I, I the, mean, everybody lost their jobs, dealers. I, I mean, so you, you, financial stress often can heighten yes. everything. It, it's just a reality. Yeah. So tell us about uh, I want to tra- fast forward and get to where you and your brother buy. And then I want to talk about what you learned in some of the hot, best days, the darkest days and advice that you would give people wanting to start a business or people currently in a business. And maybe they can't figure out particular problems that they have. And I find that it doesn't matter the industry. There are a lot of principles that are ubiquitous across all businesses. Sure. Um, so 2008, 2009, 2009, your brother comes back. Mm-hmm. Tell us how things progress up until today. 
Oh, that's a lot. A lot happened between 2009 <laughs> and today. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, my brother and I were just, you know, he came back with a new perspective and I was in a place where it was just like, okay, I need someone else to help bear this burden. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really, you know, and he, he was, he wanted to do that and he, um, he was so good at it. You know, he was so good at that and to have somebody to share that, um, responsibility with was for saved me because yeah. I was like this this might not be for me anymore because yeah. I was just sort of you know like that breaking point that mm -hmm. you were talking about now isn't your dad getting up in age at this point as well he is, and he was still you know he was still working um but not as much yeah. um he had new respect for my brother because my brother had had a lot of success and so that just um you know that that helped their relationship too. I mean, I think all of that, it kind of helped all of us. Yeah. And, um, we, the three of us just were working together more successfully. Scott had a lot of, he had great ideas, a lot of simple principles that he had learned in the, in the previous years that we just really kind of adhered to. What were some of daily. those? I mean, it was really about, um, habitual practices, you know, really we would have, for instance, we would have a meeting every day at eight 30 with our principal people in the sales department. And we would have that meeting every day for, and we would do it at both stores and we would really dig in to each car deal that had happened, you know, over time. So it's a, it, it was really about, um, Without getting too much into the minutia of the car business, yeah. but it was really about you know cash flow and and money and how important that is in any business, right? Yeah. And so we would have those conversations every single day, and so that the money would get collected, and and talk about every deal. So there would be you know you would talk about a deal maybe that didn't get made, and what you can do to try and make that deal. And you know Scott would have good ideas with that, and communication really it was really about that right yeah, about yeah everybody like so sort of things. getting around a table and talking every single day and accountability so just really basic business principles yeah. you know doing the same thing every day creating good communication um and creating those those habits yeah. and accountability so everybody knew we were going to do this meeting every day so you needed to you know you needed to be on top of your stuff yep um, I love that commitment to consistency. And that's something that uh, my brother and my, my, with my other business partners, we talk a lot about a lot and we don't, we're not always successful. As a matter of fact, I feel a lot in that, but I'm, as I get older and mature and I, I, I focus more that simple principle that you just described commitment to consistency will set you apart from surprisingly, it doesn't seem like it should be that difficult, but will set you apart from 99% of the other people out there. Yep. So it's not about doing, you know, a thousand different things. It's about doing maybe, you know, a handful of things 100% of the time. Yeah. And that is, if you can sort of key in on those, you know, that really helped our business grow and be successful. And um, during that time when you know, there was a lot of dealers that didn't survive that. We were lucky enough because our dad had, um, you know, he was always cash is king. So he had saved a lot of money. He was able to it's help It's true back us. then <laughs> yeah. and it's true today and it'll right? always be true. It'll always be true. I mean, that was one of his, you know, he had a few mantras, but that was definitely <laughs> one of them. Cash is king. And so he had a really good relationship with a small um, community bank. And so when other dealerships were losing their floor plans and their financing and basically put them out of business, we were able to keep our business going because we were able to continue to get inventory when, you know, Chrysler basically took the, took the bailout kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. When GMAC weren't, you know, went key bank, there was a lot of people that lost their dealerships because of their financing situation. Yeah. So those were lessons that Scott and I were able to take sort of forward as we grew our business after our dad died, um, that he really set us up, you know, helped, 
helped lay that foundation for success for us as we moved forward, for sure. It's funny that you talk about, uh, we had a guest <laughs> last week, uh, Ben Garland, and in so many of these um, successful entrepreneur stories, that comes up, a solid relationship with your banker, a, a, a solid banking relationship. And, you know, I think because of 2008 and 2009, some banks have gotten a negative name or, and some definitely deserve it. But, you know, having been a banker myself for many years, that is something that I don't think gets enough attention. And to your point, if you foster that banking relationship, they more times than not, and you got to find the right bank. You know, you said a local, a mm -hmm. small community bank. And a lot of times that's where you can build that strong relationship. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't have that relationship with a larger organization, BMO Harris Bank, a U.S. bank, but on a local level. Um, but I think that's overlooked a lot for entrepreneurs that, you know, banking has become a commodity like so many things. But in the hardest times, as you just pointed out, that can really determine if you've taken the time to get to know your banking partner, they've taken the time to get to know you, where those relationships are really tested and you know that you have a solid one because they'll be there for you. Yeah, I think that's true for any of your sort of advisors. That was, again, another thing that kind of came from the Dr. Ron stuff was having, you know, good advisors and good relationships. And our dad always believed in that, you know, with, with the bankers, with the factory, your attorneys, with your CPAs, really having those advisors, people that you can really trust. And, you know, when you have questions, when you have opportunities, that you're able, that you have people yeah. that you really can go to for, um, you know, good advice. Yeah. And we, we were really fortunate enough that, that we had a lot of that. And so we were able to put some of that to the test when we, you know, when we came up against things, but when there was opportunities or issues or things that you can really, but you have to foster those. And it takes, you know, it takes a lot of time and investment to yes. create, you know, a, a long lasting relationship. Yeah. But wow, our dad was like, that was totally, he really believed in that a lot. And so, you know, that was just part of, that was part of how we did business. Yeah. And if, that, if, 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 if you're running a business, that's not how you do business. You need to change because you will rely on those relationships. And a lot of people think now with the internet and it, it doesn't matter if meeting face to face and developing those personal relationships, that's just wrong. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how um, meaningful AI becomes. You won't ever be able to replace this. Mm -hmm. And this is the only thing that will survive during the toughest times from your advisors. If you've taken the time to establish something like this. I, I totally believe that. I mean, taking a little moment back, um, this is a little piece in time because I think I was, I came out of college in the 2008, 2009, went to work for Ernst Young and a lot of my friends lost their offers. And I was blessed that that didn't happen to me. But do you remember cash flip clunkers? Oh, I totally do. I, I oh just, my gosh. Yeah, I totally do. <laughs> I had a hunch that, and that was a success for you guys, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was a, it was a really, you know, it was, it was kind of genius, you know, that it, it was great to, you know, we needed something. Yeah. We needed our business needed a boost. And yeah. when you think about for small businesses, again, at the time we had two dealerships, small businesses employing uh, 120 people in a small town, all those, you know, all of those people shopping, living mm -hmm. in the community, you know, we needed to be able to keep, keep those paychecks coming. Yeah. And so to have it sort of a shot in, shot in the arm like that. Um, yeah, it was great. That was a big deal. It was great. Yeah. yeah. So, it was a sort of a pain in the neck too. Oh, I, I like, believe it. You know, you're talking about working with the government basically and all these stipulations. <laughs> it's like, well, how do you do whatever, you know, how are you going to get rid of all these cars? But yeah, no, that part, it it was, you know, it was fun. Yeah. And so for those of you who are maybe too young to know what cash for clunkers is, basically in 2009, 2010, thereabouts, the yes. economy had basically tanked. The government was trying to figure out how to revive the system, mm -hmm. so to speak. And they had z interest rates at zero. They had done everything. And so the Obama administration came up with this cash for clunkers idea to get money into the auto industry. And basically- yep. What, if you had a car that was, I don't even remember, I don't remember the age, but they were also, I think it might've, I don't know if they were tying it in with um, a green initiative or energy initiative. They were trying to get older, like uh, fuel 
consuming vehicles or something of that nature. But essentially, if you had a vehicle of a certain age, we'll just make up the age. I don't know if yep. it's 2000 or older and you took it to a dealer, the dealer would give you X number of dollars. I don't remember what it was. 5,000, 10. Well, I think it was like 5,000, okay. but I don't remember. Yeah. And then basically your vehicle was out of commission. So if you had a really like an old clunker that was maybe only worth you know, we would give you $500 for it. Now, all of a sudden you're getting $5,000 for it. And then we're just taking that vehicle out of commission, which was good for our industry because then you're able to, I mean, it was good for everybody, right? From the factory down, Yeah, you were, you know, infusing new product, um, you know, like you're saying, better, better fuel economy, mm -hmm. safer vehicles. Um, but then, you know, additional opportunity kind of for everybody. Yeah. And I mean, it was very political, like everything, even back then, everything was political. And I, I love politics. I follow politics. I've been following <laughs> it since I was like 12. So I remember that being a huge deal. And, you know, one side saying one thing and one side saying the other. But at the end of the day for the auto industry, it was a huge boon because we it, needed a shot in the arm. Yeah. We needed something. I mean, everything had sort of been, you know, for the past couple years leading up to that it had sort of all been bad. Yeah, it had. You know, just wasn't a lot of good stuff happening with the banks happening, with the, you know, the 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 bailouts, mm -hmm. with all, you know, just it, there was not a lot of good good stuff coming out of our industry in general. And so, um, yeah, it was yeah. fun. Yeah. Fun to have that. You know? I, I knew if I brought that up, you would you yeah. would have lots of stories. <laughs> and I'm sure you have lots of stories. One time we got this. Uh, and if you were, you know, a young kid and you had a, something that was worth $200, like it was it was a steal. A really <laughs> big deal for people. So it was good for consumers and it yeah. was good for the dealers yeah. and it was, you know, it helped the factory. So it really did. It, it was a good, it was a good thing. Yeah. And so um, take us to when you're, how old is your dad at that time in 2010 ish? Uh, 60. Seven. Oh, he's still young. Okay, so he he's still relatively young. Yeah. So now, he died young. So okay. He died in 2011, and he was 68. Wow. So tell us what happened then. Um, yeah. That's the other challenging <laughs> part of being in business with family because those moments in and of themselves are really challenging, and then when it has such an impact on the business, it, it makes it that much more difficult. So talk to us about that time frame, and then you know, how you and your brother got into the business together and what happened between then after he passed away up, yeah. up until today. So he, um, he had kind of at the time when he was diagnosed with lung cancer, um, he had been off for about a year. So we'll say, you know, he was sort of semi-retired ish. He was kind of like, all right, you kids, if you think, if you want to do it, you think you can do it. Okay. You guys do it. So I, you know, I don't know that it was like, oh, here, you know, you guys, it was kind of like, all right, you guys think you can do it. You kind of think. So we were like, all right, we'll do it. Um, and that's, what, that's how his generation operated. That's was, just how it was. Right. That's yeah. just kind of how that went. Yeah. So, um, but sadly, yeah, he, he was diagnosed. It was a very short illness. And, you know, during that time, it's, we're so, we're so lucky that, so there's our, we have a sister also who is not in the business. Mm -hmm. um, the, what does she do? She was in, in education. Okay. So okay. she was teacher, um, assistant principal, principal. Yeah. She all about education. And um, so the three of us spent, you know, basically sort of six weeks figuring out, uh, making sure that his affairs were all in order. Um knowing that he, that he wasn't going to live. So you guys knew and, that. And yeah, we did. I mean, I was for sure in denial, but we did know. And I mean, that they basically had told us. And so we were really lucky in that he, um, he had a lot of his affairs in order. We kind of had teased him a lot because he talked a lot about, you know, his will, his this, yeah. his that. Oh, he threw that around. You know, uh, that I know. It was like a lot. <laughs> yes. It's a, it was like a thing. It's just like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, Dad, do we have to talk about this? Because we all kind of thought he would outlive us all. <laughs> yeah. um, but we were so lucky that he really did have his affairs in order. Yeah. So if I, I mean, I would definitely... You know, people that have businesses, if your affairs are not in order, it, it, it just, it made it, it was so hard and yet he had it all in order. So for someone to go through what we went through having businesses and a lot of, you know, it was an intricate kind of situation. And, and again, on a, on a scale, it was really probably small, but 
he really had it all kind of set up for us. Yeah. There was a few little things that we ended up sort of having to scramble and do before he passed away. Um, when that happened, we, we all just kind of dug in and figured out what needed to happen. Um, it's kind of a process. I remember the CPA saying, okay, it'll be like a year. And I remember thinking, what? Like, I'm the kind of person, like, I'm just trying to like, let's just sit down. We'll get it all done. I'm the same way. Yeah. Like, just like knock it all out. And it was like a year. We're going to have to deal with this for a year. And it really did take a year. I mean, that's how long it took to sort of get it all. Imagine if you didn't have things in order. I cannot Uh imagine. I mean, for me, for sure. It was like, once it was all settled with dad, it was like, I did all my own stuff. It's like, okay. Yeah. Like you got to have it all, all kind of dialed in. So Um, words of advice, if you're, even if you're not in business, if you don't, if you haven't thought about some of these things, just because you're either afraid to think about you dying and well, likelihood it's going to happen. So take action because it makes it that much easier for those that you love around you. Um, And quite frankly, as a business owner, you have an obligation to your employees, to everybody to make sure that you've taken care of those things because otherwise all sorts of chaos can happen. Yes. I, it's just, it's sort of unimaginable to yeah. think about what could happen. So um, our sister was never in the business and she still didn't want to be in the business. So S- Scott and I just kept kind of going how we were. We had the two dealerships, um, had been involved with them for a lot of years up, up to that point. Um, business was better then. Um, we were digging a lot, digging in a lot with, um, with banks and figuring out, um, you know, our own relationship, sort of making our own way with factories and banks and, you know, all of those things, because that had really been our dad's role. So we ended up doing a lot of that. So there was a whole learning curve for, for all of those things. And then we had, um, we had an opportunity. So we had um, a group come to us and sort of said, would you want to either sell to us or would you want to buy from us? And we were like, okay, yeah, we're not, we weren't ready to sell. I I love when those opportunities come along. And so we ended up buying two more dealerships that were right in our town. So Hillsboro, small little town, right? Mm -hmm. What's the population? Oh gosh. I don't even know. Are are we talking, are we talking like 20,000, 200,000, 2 million, not 2 million, obviously, but yeah. So Portland's probably what? Two million and we're on the outskirts. Okay. Okay. So you're a suburb of Portland. Yes. Okay. Suburb of Portland. So, um, so that was a whole thing to buy. We bought normally people would buy one dealership at a time, but not us. We bought two. (laughs) So we basically were doubling our size overnight. Yeah. And we, because you already had two. Because we already had two. Yeah. And then we were buying two. So we had two domestic and then we were buying two import. Okay. Um, now, what does that explain that to our listeners? What do you so mean by that? So we had um, Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge okay. and and Ford. So those were the dealerships that our dad had that we had always worked at, kind of the original stores. The domestic stores. The domestic stores. Yep. And then we bought uh, a Honda dealership and a Hyundai dealership. Okay. So we were um, kind of on two ends, of, on opposite ends of town. We had um, Honda and, and Dodge, and then we had Ford and Hyundai on the other um, on the other end. I mean, we'd never bought a dealership. So huge, huge learning curve. Um, bought from fabulous people. Uh, so the Larry Miller Group, I will give them a shout out because they were amazing to do business with. That's awesome. I can't imagine what. I mean, as hard as it was, I can't imagine what how much harder it would have been if we would have been dealing with other organizations that we've yeah. dealt with, um, you know, since. Um, so we, you know, we sort of doubled in size overnight. Um, I remember us having conversations, like looking at each other and saying, okay, like, are we really doing this? Are we, is this like can we do this? Is this going to happen? I remember thinking, okay, well, this is, this means 10 more years for me. I'm going to be in the business for at least 10 more years Mm -hmm. um, before I can retire. Right. Um, I love that you give us insight into those because for those of you who have experienced it, you know exactly what Shannon's talking about. Um, And I've been through a number of those points with different businesses for those of you who haven't, you'll recognize when you do, and it's an exciting time frame, but it's also really scary because to your point, it's terrifying. It's it's where all the emotions 
commitment. Do I really want to do this? It, and it, it doesn't matter, you know, if you've been in a business for 10, 15, 20 years, but for you guys, you had been in it for long. You're basically sealing, like, if we do this, I'm making this commitment for another, like you said, 10, 15 years. And great, we just got everything paid down and now we're going to re-up our leverage. That's scary. Like, yep. that's scary. But those moments are really where you find out who's made of metal and who's not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, really, in the reality. And and anybody that says, oh, those are easier, those are, well, I mean, it's human to go through everything you just described of, you know, the exciting part. Oh, boy, we're doubling in size. And there's always an ego portion to it. Um, just cause it's exciting and you're like, look at what we've accomplished. And then there's the scary side of it. Like, oh boy, are we really going to go through with this, sign those papers and take on this level of responsibility? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it was kind of crazy at the time. Did um, it happen fast or was it a pretty drawn out process? Um, well, it's faster to buy than it is to sell. I will say that. Because <laughs> you've done both. Yeah, so we'll I've get to the both. sell part. Yeah, so it's faster to buy than it is to sell. Um, and sometimes there's so many points along the way, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. where you just think, is this actually going to happen? Are we really going through with this? Or is it? are they really going to, you know, do we still want to do it? There's just so many points along the way because yeah. there's so much that you have to do to try and sort of get to that. And then in, you know, specifically, and maybe this is in all industries, but as we're going through these, this process, there's always a lot of sort of confidentiality and secrecy. So you have to keep it all sort of locked down because yeah. nobody can know, you know, you don't want, you just don't want people to panic because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, and the employees, obviously it's a really big deal. You don't want people to. That's the to, hardest part. It's so hard. I remember having to play the game when we were, we were in a similar situation where we wanted to buy, but our competitor, this was in the garbage service industry that I've talked a lot about on the podcast. Um, but our, our competitor didn't want to sell. And so we're like, okay, well, we can't keep duking it out. And, but, um, and it worked out great, but try having to, to put on that facade for mm -hmm. a while for your employees, just for their protection. It's tough. It's a really hard. Yeah. That I would say that's one of the hardest things yes. in buying or selling is that, you know, that piece of it. Um, so I think go and going through that, you know, with my brother, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you build other bonds with yes. that because you yeah. really, you know, you're, you're sort of in it together. Yeah. You're sort of commiserating your, your, you know, and, you know, our futures were so, so tied and so linked together yeah. that, you know, we obviously relied on each other so much. I think that's the beautiful part of being in business with family though, because you, bu you build those bonds that maybe other families don't get to build because, because you're in business. So while there's often challenges, there are certainly a lot of rewards. Oh, for sure. And we were lucky enough to, I, we haven't really talked about this, but I just want to throw this in. One of the things that we were able to do when my dad passed away is we were able to start a small family foundation. And so as a family to have that, that and is to awesome. really, you know, sort of continue the legacy of our dad and to have that you know, we're, you're, you're building for your family. So my brother's family, you know, my family, my daughter, mm -hmm. you know, our sister and her family. So, and then to have that, um, family foundation has really allowed us to sort of bring everybody together, all the grandkids, yeah. um, all, you know, that, that has been a really fun, fun piece. What's the name of the foundation? The Inukai Family Foundation. Fantastic. And yes. can people donate or no? You can it's donate. Just... Yep. You can donate online. You can find us online That's at inukaifamilyfoundation.org. And what does that focus on? Uh, you know, we're, we're, it's, um, we do a lot with education. Okay. So we've donated, again, we're small, but we've donated a lot to schools, teachers, um, we've done a lot around Japanese culture and education. So we've done a, a bunch around that. We've done scholarships for the Dix Auto Group's um, employees. That's, so we've done, I we've done that. a bunch of that. Yeah. Um, we've done some stuff around seniors as well. So, uh, you know, our dad, he, he always said like kids and, and old people, that was kind of his thing. It's like the, he, you know, an education. So he was a big believer in that. And so we just, as we were 
figuring out, okay, what's this foundation going to be? It's going to be, you know, those, the things that dad really cared about yeah. that are important and really foundational in our society. That's, that's, that's what we focused on too. That's fantastic that you guys took, in spite of still running the business, you took the time to, to put something like that together to pay homage to, to your dad. It's been really great. It's, uh, I, I'm always amazed at how people just, oh, foundations pop up all the time. I, they're a lot of work. I'm just going to say it's not, you know, it, I've heard it, that it is a lot of work to yeah. sort of put it all together, but it's totally been worth it. Good. Yeah. It's been really great. So you guys established that when he passed away, we did. Okay. And now you and your brother just doubled in size. Yes. Take us. That's 2012, 2013, 2014, 20, um, 2013. Okay. And now take us to when you get to the sell point. Yeah. So 2013 up to sort of 20, 20 really did we we bought another dealership right before we sold a dodge chrysler or domestic for chevrolet a chevy also also yeah so, so you have a dodge chrysler uh a, a chevy a ford a hyundai and a honda yep holy smokes yep. i didn't know those corporations played well together but and all within you know all in the same town three of the dealerships were you really could walk to them you guys so, have a monopoly in Hillsborough. It was kind of part of our, um, you know, part of our strategy. Our strategy yeah, was it's logical. That, um, one of the things that we found when we added the two dealerships and doubled in size was that um, it was challenging to create the same culture that we had at Dodge and Ford mm. after being there for so many years to sort of create that same culture. Um, as a probably the hardest thing we ever did or didn't do, you know, and, and, and worked on always was creating that because you could always, you could always feel that, you know, we had our, our people that worked at Dodge and people that worked at Ford had known our dad. Yeah. People that worked at Honda, people that worked at Hyundai, they never knew dad. Mm -hmm. And so there was like, they're trying to create that culture across the brands Anyway, that was part of part of our strategy. And a lot of times when we looked at buying other businesses that were um, not in our area or further away, that was always a really big drawback because it was like, OK, well, we're in the same town. We're right here trying to recreate this and it can be really challenging. How are we going to do it if we're in another state yeah. or in another town? So but. That's all. That's something really important to think about if you're thinking about growing through M and A mergers and acquisitions. Because even if you're just growing organically and you're going to start another, uh, you know, branch, depending on the industry or location, distance. It's hard enough if they're next door. Let alone adding mm -hmm. distance. It's a whole nother ball game, ball game. And that creating that culture is one of the most critical components yeah. of your business to be successful, I think. Yeah. And I want to get back to culture because we, we, one of our mantras on this podcast, and it's not our mantra, but we say it a lot is culture eats strategy for breakfast every day of the week and twice on Sundays. A lot of businesses don't get that yeah. or they forget about that. So I want to go back to why culture was so important to you guys and why it was such a challenge when you doubled in size. But so you, you double in size. When do you buy the fifth dealership? Uh, 20, 2021, I think think okay so you, you or maybe had, it was 2020 2020 before or after you had you sold before okay so before and tell us how you got to for you personally the and i think i i talk to a lot of um well across multiple industries but particularly right now it's relevant because i'm talking to a lot of subcontractors uh we're a general contractor we've talked about it in holland brothers construction we do a bunch of work but we have a lot of subcontractors and I talk with, whether it's electricians, HVAC, plumbers, and what I see, and I think this is common across a lot of industries, is older gentlemen who are from that generation. You work and you work and you build and you create and you have a strong sense of pride in what you do. And they are at a tough point because they don't want to leave. You know, they sometimes, you know, as we see with our politicians, they don't know when to hang it up. Um, and it's particularly hard when you're, when you're a business owner, because it's like a part of you, Yes. but a big part of that is they don't have anybody to pass it down to, mm -hmm. especially in the trades. Yeah. So for you, how did you know when it was time for you personally to take that next step 
because that's really a hard decision for a lot of people in a lot of industries for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, I think personally for me, so again, back to Dr. Ron, um, a number at some point he had said, and I think he was really referring to that to that generation that you're talking about, that they would really never retire. And one of the sort of strategies or things that you should do um, would be to set a date. So one of the things that we did in our business a lot, and one of the things that my brother is a huge proponent of is goal setting. And so we would spend a lot of time, you know, on business goals, obviously, and then individuals, individual personal goals. And that was a really, um, it was just a big part of our, of our culture Mm -hmm. and that we would share with our, with all of our sort of, you know, executive team management team. And one of the things that I had done kind of when we bought and expanded with Honda and Hyundai was I had said I would work another 10 years because at some point in time, I always thought, Oh, I'll retire when I'm 50. Um, you know, it's just, that's, that was just seemed like a good time to retire. And you know, when you're 30, 50 seems ancient. (laughs) So it seemed like a good idea. Yeah. Um, so I had set a retirement date and, um, and that was part of the, this planning and your personal goal, part of my personal goal. So every year, you know, my retirement date would get carried over. That's fantastic. And so we would talk about it. And as it was nearing, um, so it was actually um, June of 2024. So it hasn't come yet, but I am retired. So you June achieved of, your goal a couple I, years early. Yeah, that's the way to do goals. Right. So, um, but we would talk about it. And, you know, it wasn't when you own, you know, a business like ours and a complex, any kind of complex business, it's not like um, June 30th, 2024, we can't like say, I'm going to, you know, we can't start planning for it in May of 2024, yeah, no. right? It's a, you know, there's a lot that has to happen mm-hmm. to sort of unravel all this and, and uh, a way more than I would even ever, ever thought, actually, it, you know, I would say of all the hard things I've done, selling our business and retiring was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Selling our business was one the, was hands down the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, emotionally, but, um, physically, everything, everything you have to, everything okay. about it, yeah. everything from the negotiations yeah. to the, to that first conversation. And, you know, in all honesty, we had had those conversations before, but we'd never really gotten very far down the line. And it was kind of like, as it, you know, like anything, it was an opportunity that we were presented with. Mm-hmm. And so then you have to sort of decide like does it make sense i mean is this an opportunity i mean now who are you selling to or or tell us you you said you had these negotiations was this you selling to scott was this um or or, or was this a combination of things okay so we sold to a a third party okay and i sold to my brother so i was able to um scott's your brother yes yeah yeah so um we sold the three domestic stores to a third party. Okay. So Scott and I did that together. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other two import stores, Scott bought me out of those, which is what allowed me to retire. Yeah. And so Scott and I still have um, business dealings together. So we still, we own some property together and some other things. So we still have an opportunity to work together, which is really great. But But you were ready to be done. And he was like, I'm, I so still got this. Yep. He's younger than me. Yep. So as we said, he's younger yep. than me. I really, after 2020, um, so 2020, um, 2021 were really probably the biggest, uh, biggest financial years that the car industry has ever seen. COVID. I, uh, and yep. people are. Um, Ironically enough, yeah. it was just like a weird you know, COVID hit and we're like, okay, like this is it. We're going to go out of business. We're going to lose everything. And the total opposite happened. Isn't that crazy? It was the craziest thing that I've ever seen. I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah. yeah just completely crazy. And it, it wasn't just us, obviously. There no. was a lot of, I mean, construction. I oh. mean, my gosh, I, you know, just like. So many industries. 
so many industries yeah. that had that happen, right? And for me, you know, buy low, sell high, right? So that seemed to make sense Logic. to me. Yeah. And um, the opportunity presented itself. And so I was able to retire early. Yeah. And yeah. And it's been amazing. Like, it's been amazing. I'm so, I'm so happy that it went the way it did. But I mean, it was hard. Yeah. So I want to get in the details of what made it hard because a lot of people think about when you're to the point where you're like, oh, I'm going to sell my business. I'm going to get all this money, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, you just hold the phone there, Charlie, because it is a lot of work. Oh my gosh. It doesn't matter. When we sold our business, I was basically at the buyer's um, location probably four or five months straight trying to make sure that the customers didn't have an idea from a service perspective that anything had changed. Yeah. And that's challenging in every business. For our business, obviously, picking up people's trash, which isn't a life or death situation. But when people's trash doesn't get picked up, you think it's a life or, you know, like, you know <laughs> when people call, it seems like it's a life or death situation. At least, but to your point, same thing in the car industry. When those transitions happen, like when your business is rooted on the foundation as pretty much every business customer service, you don't want them to know. And I think that's what makes it so hard for people such as yourself that actually care about making that transition, not only for customers, but for employees, for everybody involved, almost seamless. It takes an incredible amount of effort on both sides parts the owners or the buyer the buyers and the sellers parts and and that's really what you're detailing that's so challenging i think so i i think for you know it was really one of the most important things for us was to make sure that the employees because these you know these were the original stores long term employees um it was really, really important for us that they were going to be taken care of, that it would be, you know, as, um, as easy as possible, even though we knew it was going to be hard. There was, it, it just, you know, we were close to people, Yeah. you know, and, um, most good businesses are hopefully people felt that we were as, you know, that they felt as close to us as we felt to them, you know, we, they were family. Yeah. And so, um, even though it was important for us, like I wanted to retire. I didn't want to, um, you know, work forever. Yeah. It just, you know, and everybody, I will say, you know, when we did make those announcements and all of that, people were very gracious, even though I know it was hard. It's hard. It's scary. So one of the things that was really important to us as we were look, at, you know, as, as the buyer came to us, as this opportunity presented itself was, is this, are they going to be the same as we were. I yeah. mean, will they, will the culture be at least similar? Will mm -hmm. they treat the people the same? Will they, and that was a really, really important piece. And that, you know, was one of the reasons why we ended up moving forward because we did feel like that they would. Um, and so, but it was hard. It was, yeah. it's a hard, it's, you know, Dr. Ron used to say like for parents, like for our dad, it was like, he was like, you'd be like adopting out your kids or whatever, that kind of thing. And that's kind of how it feels. You know, these are, they're your people. You're really protective of them. You yeah. care about them. You've seen so much. You've been through so much together. And you think about that, that, I mean, that was one of the hardest things that we did. And you're, you know, you're negotiating all of these points, you know. Negotiation is hard. The, e even if you have a great buyer and you're a great seller. <laughs> Uh, you know, negotiations is, uh, that's, that's part of the process. That's, I enjoy the negotiation side, but it's also really, really hard. Thank goodness. Um, my brother, that was, his. he's so <laughs> much better at that than me. So much better. Well, everybody plays their part. <laughs> um, so, so you retire and you're living the dream now. Yep. So, which is fantastic. I am, which is how we got the chance to meet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so tell us about, before we get to culture, because that's something I really want to hone in because it's so important. How did the sale matriculate? Did Had you guys put yourself on the market in soda? I imagine it's a, a, a close-knit industry, but how did this group know to come to you? Because a lot of people are like, you know, I want to sell my business, but I don't know how to let people know without, you know, my employee. It's that whole thing mm -hmm. we were talking about. How did that matriculate for you guys? 
you know, the, the head of the group that we sold to, we, we were acquaintances and they just randomly called. So really, he called me, we talked and I was like, no, I don't think so, but I'll ask my brother and I'll call you if we, if we want to talk. It was, that's really how it happened. That's awesome. And I think that's just, yeah, you and I have talked and you, in spite of having competitors, and this is another really important thing in your industry, get to know everybody in your industry. Oh yeah. Because you never know how, when you're going to need someone else's hand or when they're going to need your help. And I feel like the, the most successful businesses, even if you do have competitors, there has to be a certain level of friendly competition. Um, and I think this is probably more true. And I think uh, small to medium sized businesses are all the better for it versus the big behemoths where they duke it out and they, you know, you know, wars over who's on the board and what have mm-hmm. you. But more than likely, you guys knew each other through industry events and what have you. Is that right? Yeah, well, actually, our dads had known each other okay. and done some stuff together. And but for sure, in the car business, there is a lot of, um, you know, there is friendly competition. But we, you know, like in Oregon and in all states, really, I think there's um, auto associations, you know, uh, trade associations that we're all members of and we get together and do things together. And yeah. so, you know, we kind of all know each other. Um, and that, I, yeah, I think that that's a really, it, it's, it's an important part for our industry. Um, like we, we talked about politics or anything like that. If you're yeah. talking about, you know, legislatively and all of that, yeah. the car industry is heavy, heavily regulated and those trade associations and working together f- for the good of the whole group is important it's extremely important so uh before we get to culture so one of the things that i think you know we have this idea in society and i talk about this a lot and the reason i do is to dispel this myth our society has glamorized being an entrepreneur and Mm -hmm. oh boy you know you're gonna make a lot of money and it's easy and you're 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 gonna you're you're gonna have vacations (laughs) all the time and everybody else does the work i mean all of these fallacies Mm -hmm. and i think anybody who of course has been an entrepreneur knows it's all completely i don't know how these truths or these um figments of someone's imagination come to be so prevalent but it's the exact opposite you know you're broke forever until you work your tail (laughs) off you work seven days a week 18 hours a day it takes a burden on your personal life your professional Mm -hmm. life when you think about you've talked about some of the most challenging times um when you think about the hardest time professionally speaking probably the lowest moment for you Reflect on what got you through it, because I think one of the most challenging things in business is, you know, everybody has highs and lows in life. That's just part of being a human. But entrepreneurs, because things change so quickly, you know, one day you can be flying on the clouds and the next day you're six feet under all sorts of reasons, you know, make your main employee quits or something happens in your industry. I mean, COVID should be that an example for, (laughs) you just never know what's going to happen. So as entrepreneurs, that volatility is magnified by 10, just by the inherent nature of being an entrepreneur and owning a business and having so much responsibility. So I always ask people, how did you find, or what methods did you use to deal with the extremely high highs and the extremely low lows and dealing with that type of volatility that is not natural for us as humans to automatically know how to handle. I think, I mean, I was lucky enough that I had a really great partner and I think, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of some specific times where things where business was tough. You're talking about business and partner. Business, yeah. So, and when business was really hard and how Scott and I were able to come together and really sort of build a plan forward. I mean, I, it's a, it's probably a good segue into culture because one of the things we had come off some sort of really mediocre years and I think I was just feeling, you know, unenthused about the business and thinking about, um, this was pre COVID and really thinking about my retirement, like, Mm -hmm. okay, so the business is not great. 
So how am I going to retire? You know, when you own a business, when you're an entrepreneur, you have everything in your business, you know, every, it's all tied to that. There's not, you know, what's it, it's, um, you know, the, the car business can be very lucrative, but again, cash is king. It's Mm -hmm. a very cash heavy business Mm -hmm. when you're all of your, when everything is, is tied to that. It's your 401k investments, everything. It's It's your life. It's everything. So it's like, well, if the business is crappy, then, you know, it makes it harder to think about that. Yeah. And um, one of the things that we did, and it was really, it was really Scott, he really started um, reading a lot of business books, which he had always done, I think, which he was always, um, that was something that he had done. But him and I started um, reading and listening to books. And there was in that period, it, it changed my life. It changed my perspective on our entire business. But I must have, I think I consumed about 50, there was like 50 books. Wow. In that that, year. What year is this? Like 17? 2018, 2018, between 20, it was after 17. So yeah, it's probably 2018 to 2019 in there. And um, we really, one of the things that came out of that was, okay, our business, it really is just about culture. And we just dug in on that culture piece to really try and bring our team together and knowing that even after all these years, so you think whatever, five, six, seven, however many years it had been since we'd bought the other stores, that we still, those were some of our biggest challenges were, was that culture piece at those other dealerships. And um, it was transformational. And for attitude, you know, sort of that, the power of a positive team thing that was, could not have been more true. And it was, um, yeah, it, it, so, I mean, I had a good partner. Yeah. You know, my brother yeah. was an amazing partner and he sort of helped pull me out of that. And I, I, it, it was transformational. Favorite business book or top. Okay. Well, one of the first ones that we read that I loved and could not stop talking about was Extreme Ownership. Okay. I haven't read that one. So I'm going to put that on my list. Okay. Yeah. You have to, um, I'm terrible at like remembering the names, but it's a couple of um, Navy SEALs that write it and they talk about um, just extreme ownership. It's a very simple principle, but that just owning, owning everything. So no matter what happens, that one principle could change your whole business because if you think about everything that happens in a business really from a business stamp as owners. So that was our first book that we really read together. You know, it was all on us. So we were having some really mediocre years. Take a look in the mirror. Yeah. Cause it was really all on us it, and it was everything. So that was the foundation for everything. It was It was us. So if we wanted it to be different and everything and they, um, these guys that write this book are just, they talk, I mean, they're in, you know, they're having wars and it's that, that was, I mean, it was a really, you know, not the car business, not selling cars and, you know, but, um, that one principle was really, um, it was transformational. Yeah. And that's, uh, it sounds like a great book that I'm going to read. And uh, there's a few, have you heard of, um, good to great? Yes. By, so I we yes. did a book review on the podcast a couple episodes and yep. one of the things he talks about these companies is um confront the brutal facts. Yep. And extreme ownership is one of those where there's a problem. As you said, look at yourself. It's you. Yep. You can blame it on everybody else. You can uh, you're the owner. If you want to do something about it, think about how that changes everybody around you. And so that book, not only for our business, but in my own, my personal life, you think about all these books that you, um, that, that was, uh, that one is amazing. So I can't wait for you to read it and you're going to love it. Yes. I know I will. Um, the, I can't think of, um, John Gordon about being on the right bus. Why can't I think of the title? But it that that was another one that was yeah, it was right. um let's just look at uh, I'm a big believer in um making sure that everybody was in the right position. So that was a huge 
she can have like all these really great employees that have, you know, whatever their, their weaknesses, their strengths, all of that, make sure, making sure that those people are in the right position. Um, that was another book that was really like, okay, like, look, this, we, we love this employee. The energy boss. Yes. The energy boss. We love okay. this. We love this employee. Maybe, you know, it's our fault that they're not having success yeah. because we've got them in the wrong job. Yeah. They're in the wrong position. They're in the wrong, you know what I mean? That kind of, so that was a really, that's a really good one too yeah. that I love. And I love all the John Gordon books. He's yeah. like amazing. The, the, I think that's what, having spent so much time in the corporate world, I think that is where so many corporate, well, I'm, you know, they get culture wrong. They get, there's some great ones. There's no question, but I love when you talk about you and Scott get together, you educate yourself, you learn from other people, which is the whole point of, you know, what's the point of being a business or listening to a podcast or what, if you're not going to if learn from other people's experiences. And as you said, just that is transformational, can be transformational because it changes this and opens mm -hmm. your perspective yes. like we were talking about. Yes. But you guys made a decision and you enacted it. You know, one of the things that frustrates me to no end in the corporate world is you, you don't have that benefit. Um, and so if someone works in a corporate world or you're in a large organization, you're the owner and it's bureaucracy, you need to figure out how to get rid of that because mm -hmm. you can't make those relevant changes is you've, if you have a million different levels or layers of management, you guys made a decision and said, this is on us. How can we change this? And that's very empowering because I think there's a lot of us and, you know, it's not like you make a decision that changes overnight. Right. Right. That's Obviously true. it took you guys a long time to make those and culture is the hardest thing to change. Oh my gosh. It really is. You just don't realize how it just is woven into yeah. the fabric of your business in every little way and all the things that you do that impact it. And so we, we spent a lot of time really sort of really digging into the nitty gritty of that. And, um, it paid off. It totally paid off. But it also comes with hard decisions. I remember, you know, this is something that, um, Joe, my business partner <laughs> in the garbage company, uh, and I learned the hard way is one bad negative employee can destroy a whole culture mm -hmm. like that. Yep. And it's hard to make that decision sometimes mm -hmm. to let someone go. Yes. But what we, what we learned is in your gut, if you know it's right, don't keep them on for seven months or 12 months or mm -hmm. 18 months. You need to make the change as is necessary. Yep. And we, you know, and we're all, if you're in a leadership position, you're, you know, we're all guilty of doing that because it's, that it's hard. Yes. It's hard to, to let people go. Yeah, it is. And so again, one of the things that we really focused on obviously is, you know, that hiring piece is so important because if you, if you get the wrong person and you put them in the wrong position, it can, it really can hurt your business. And it's hard to, it's really hard to unwind that. And it's expensive. Yeah, it is. It's incredible. And it hurts them. Yes. Because to your point, you can have the most amazing employee, but if they're in the wrong spot, mm -hmm. it can just become disastrous. Um, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Have you read that? Oh, is he the, is he the Navy yes, he is. guy yep, and yep. single mom? Was yes. He yep, yep. Yep. Abusive yep. dad. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep, yep, so yep, that's, yep. That, 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 that's a book that I thought was um one of those where he, he's a little bit crass, yep. um, but it's another one of those, like, look at yourself in the mirror, like face the facts. Yes. Okay. So that's how you dealt with the volatility, the highs and lows. You had an excellent business partner um, and you guys were just brutally honest with each other and with yourselves yes. and you made adjustments. And we had Dr. Ron. And, and Dr. Ron. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, I think if you, anybody who's successful, you need mentors. You need oh, mentors yes. who are outside and can see the situation differently than you, because as owners, you get so wrapped up into the details and minutia. Sometimes you can't see the elephant, the blatantly obvious answer of what needs to be done. That's standing five feet in front of you, just by the very nature of being so busy and being so involved. Yeah. We were part of a, a 20 group mm -hmm. um, that just would, we would meet three times, three times a year um, dealers from all over the country 
And uh, that is one of the things that we would do with, with the other dealers is talk about, you know, they would help us. We would all help each other. If you had decisions to be made and um, there was a decision that Scott and I had to make regarding the dealership that we, a franchise that we had purchased and um, were having some real trouble with. And we, we had a lot that we needed to invest. We'd had some, you know, we'd had some issues with it and we had to decide, okay, is this a, is this a cut and run kind of situation or is this a, we're going to dig in because we made this decision and we're going to keep going no matter what. And they helped us make that decision. It was, it was, it was so easy for them. It was so easy for them to see looking on the outside and we had struggled with it so much. And even after they, you know, basically said, no, you, this is what you guys should do. You know, and what did they hot, say? Cut and run, cut and run. Yeah. It was a cut and run kind well, of situation. It, and you- it was, it was hard. And I know, you know, Scott and I were kind of on opposite sides of it, but it was like, it was just so clear um, that that's what we should do. Um, but man, that's tough. I, that, I, that's re- It's really hard to admit at that point, like, okay, this was like a really bad idea. We shouldn't yeah. do this. And then, you know, all the money, it's really expensive to do that. Yeah, it is. But th- the right decision. And I love what you just pointed out is, it was so obvious to everybody else out and when, they didn't even have to think well, about it. <laughs> and the thing is when, when your heart is in something like that and um, that's why it's so important to have people who can be emotionally detached. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have friends or people in your business sphere or mentors that can be that brutally honest with you, you need to find them because yeah. I mean, these are people that we respected yes. super successful yeah. that like, <clears throat> You know, if they tell you this is how you can make money, you're going to listen to them because they know how to do it. Exactly. And so when they said, no, this is not, you know, but it's, it's, it, it's hard, it's hard to do because you do, you get, you know, you get invested in it, yeah. you know, and you, when you make a decision, you're like, okay, yeah, we made this decision. We have invested all this time and money and, you know, and then you're like, okay, now to just, to walk away from it, it's pretty tough. Yeah. But it was the right but decision. Looking it was. At the right decision. That's fantastic. It was absolutely the right decision for us. Business partners. We talk a lot about business partners on this podcast. You had a fantastic business partner. Um, I've had fantastic business partners. I've had not such fantastic. I've been all through the, uh, the gamut and no, like, um, you know, you hear of these deals where they're duking out in court and all these things, you know, oh my gosh, thankfully yeah. nothing yeah. like yeah. that, but a lot of people, um, what advice would you give to people who are thinking about going into business and they either have someone that they want to go into business with, uh, but they don't, they've never been in business or they don't, or maybe they've had a bad business partner experience. Do you need a business partner? Don't you need a business partner? What advice would you give to someone about what you should look at if you're going to have a business partner? And I'm a huge advocate of having business partners. I just think number one, um, someone to go through the same thing you're going through. And number two, there's no human in the world that has all the strengths that are necessary. Mm -hmm. So not that it has to be a business partner. You can surround yourself with people that do it, but that can be expensive. And so if you're starting something and you don't have money to go hire a, you know, director of marketing and a director of HR and this, that, and the other thing, often business partners wear multiple hats. What advice would you give on the business partner front across all of those areas? Yeah. I mean, I think if you're not family, I I think um, having the same values is, you know, sort of, I think would be one of the most important things because your approach to the business will be similar. I think, and it's, you know, really simple, it seems simple anyway, the same as in any relationship, if you're, you know, uh, trust, I think about for Scott and I, you know, we had the same kind of values and we trusted each other, which is the same in my marriage. You know, we have trust. It's, it's super foundational, right? Trust and having the same similar, um, you know, values so that your approach to business would be the same. Now, Scott and I are totally different. Like we could not be more different. So you know, you don't have to be the same. It would yeah. like our business would not have been successful if Scott and I were both like me. 
And it would not have been as successful if we were, you know, it would have been harder if we were both like Scott. Yep. So it it's it's not about being the same in your personality or or whatever, but having those foundational things for trust and your, you know, your values and how your approach to business, I think you know, that would be something that you would want to look for in a business partner. But when you're in your personal life, you can date and you get to date and all that doesn't matter. <laughs> in business partners, you can't, you don't really get to do that. Like, so, you know, I've seen it where people think they have the same values, but people's true character comes out during the most challenging times. Yeah. Well, I think for sure it, it needs to be, if it's not going to be a relationship that's been already tested the test of time, then you got to have some good, good lawyers and good contracts, well, yeah. you know yeah. I mean? Yeah. And, and, if <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> and plan for the worst. Cause if it does go South, you want to make sure that you have that in place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, it makes me think of, I, I have these friends that were in, in a, uh, a, a business relationship together for many, many years. Um, but they didn't own their own business. They just worked together. Uh. And it a very successful relationship over probably 15 years. And then they went into business together. And because they had had this long longstanding um, uh, relationship, they they knew each other very well. Mm -hmm. And so they've had a lot of success. Now, I don't I haven't dug in with them. It's been a couple of years since mm -hmm. they started their own business together. But they they on the outside, they they appear to continue to have much success. And I think a lot of that is born out of their previous sort of figuring out how to navigate that relationship. Yeah. And that really comes with time. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know. So make sure it's either standard the test of time or you've got some great contracts. And, exactly. And if, great, if it's a stranger, <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, know. <laughs> yeah, then you might want to stay away. Um, in terms of, there are a lot of people who are paralyzed by fear when it comes to entrepreneurship. Um, they think they want to be an entrepreneur. They want to be an entrepreneur, but they're either in a job where they make too much money. So it's too hard to walk away mm. when I think that's just an excuse. I think fear is really what dictates so many decisions or For sure. lack of action. And a lot of people think entrepreneurship is extremely risky. I'm a big believer, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs are a big believer, it's actually more risky to take no action and to not bet on yourself than to bet on someone else. Now, it's not like you just decide, wake up one morning and do it. You should plan. But what advice, given everything you've been through, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, would you give to someone who is, they, they don't know how to get past that fear or take that one step to actually become an entrepreneur, whether it's buying a business or starting a business or just taking some action, what advice would you give to them? Hmm. I mean, I, I think one of the things you're, you're talking about with taking some action, I mean, that was, again, one of sort of our principles of business is was that it's better to do something than to do nothing at all. So you have to make a decision and making a decision, even if it's the wrong one, it, there's opportunity in that in itself. So if it, it, it's, it's a learning opportunity, something else will come out of that. So I think, you know, being paralyzed with fear is no place you, you can't, it's not a place to live, right? So you have to take mm -hmm. some action. So you're either going to dig into the to the job that you're at and give that all 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 its, you know, you know, go for a promotion, go, you know, do whatever to to fill that void. Yeah. But to take some action, I think you really you really I think that's the 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 place where you have to be. What would you for you, you grew up with cars. Yep. And so not that was a natural thing that you were automatically going to go into the industry. It definitely was not a natural thing. Yeah. And so, and so you, you eventually did, but it took a lot of work on your part. There's a lot of people who want to start something, but they don't know what, what advice would you give to them? If you are an entrepreneur, 
that's the big question, right? Well, what am I going to do? Yeah, I think you have to you have to find what you're what you're passionate about, what you what what moves you. But you weren't particularly what... passionate about cars, Not right? about cars, uh-uh. No, I don't think so. And, and I don't think, um, like my brother, I mean, he loves cars. Yeah. Like that's, it's just, you know, he loves cars. For me, I think it was more about the the people, about the variety, about doing something that felt like it mattered, um, that I felt like I was contributing that my uh, that my being there every day actually, you know, I brought something to the table. You made a difference. Yeah, yeah. that I you made had, a difference. Yeah, yeah, and allowed. Um, so yeah, so I wasn't really. I, I mean, it's. I know it's. It's. It sounds like I don't want to say. Oh, I wasn't passionate about cars, but cars were not. That wasn't the driving thing for me. But that was. That is what we sold. Yeah, you found something else in the business that drove you that you were excited yes. to go to work every day and be passionate about. Yes, but, I mean, I loved that our business. You know, the car business is something different every single day. That was the thing, and I think a lot of businesses or industries are like that, right? Yeah. It was when you're dealing with people. It was just I got to do something different all the time. I got to. I did a lot of traveling with the car business. Even when I wasn't an owner, uh, lots of training, lots of meetings, opportunities. So that part, I always really liked that part. And I never would have thought that being in the car business would allow me to, you know, travel and, and meet as many people as I did. And, and you enjoyed that. I did enjoy yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. Now you have a family, you have a daughter, uh -huh. you have a husband. Yep. Business. Being an entrepreneur is a lot of work and it can put strains on family and business. How do you make it work? What, what do you think? Cause you've obviously made it work and it's been very successful as you've already told us with not without its challenges and really having to work, but what advice would you give to people who are concerned that they're going to have to give up. They're going to have to sacrifice too much on the personal side to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I think that there are probably some sacrifices, but it's about what kind of partner and support that you have at home. And I was really lucky, you know, just to have a really supportive, a supportive spouse. Yeah. And um, I think during the sort of the, probably busiest and most intense times in my career. Um, you know, my daughter was, was older. So that, that, that helped. It worked out. You know, yeah. she was sort of, you know, in college and doing her thing. And so not being at home was, uh, it was, I didn't have to worry about that as much. Yeah. Um, and she's not going into the car business, right? Nope. Nope. <laughs> okay. Nope. Her and I talked about that a lot. You know, I, you know, being in business with your family is not for the faint of heart. Yeah. And her and I have a really close relationship and, um, and the car business is hard. So had she had a passion for it, um, then I think that that definitely would have been something that I would have supported. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not the kind of thing you do as a, oh, maybe I'll just do this yeah. or a plan B kind of thing. It's just not that kind of business. And you got to have your heart in it. You got to have your heart in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you got to be all in. It, it just is that kind of a, it, it's that kind of a business. Yeah. And I think it's almost um, all businesses are really like that. Yeah. Because if your heart's not in it, I think the car, car business, and you can speak more knowledgeably to this is it's very volatile. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this. And so if your heart isn't in it during the most challenging times, like you're just going to walk away. Yep. Like you're, you're, if you have the opportunity, you're going to say, yep. this just isn't. Yeah, you got to have the vision for the long, you know, you can't, because yeah. every, every month, you know, it's every month is different, you right? What you so kill. it's, yep. And so that's, um, you have to, you just have to have a long-term vision and the, the, the heart for it to know that, you know, it's not. It's not just about, you know, right now. I mean, it is, but it isn't, right? You, yeah. You know. If you could go back and tell your 25 or 30-year-old self three pieces of advice, oh, life, gosh, business, or indifferent, <laughs> what, even one, what is the, you know, I think 
so much of our society is about being in business for money or to accumulate more. And I think that's changing. And uh, I guess this is another way of me asking, number one, do you think money brings you happiness? But it's much bigger than that. You have the benefit of having seen so much. And my favorite thing is to interview people who have been through a lot more than I have from an economy perspective, from, I mean, just the the wisdom that comes with time, especially as entrepreneurs, I think is incredible. So if you had the opportunity to maybe tell your daughter, Casey, hey, this is what I learned about life through everything I've experienced, because uh, Casey's around 30 right now, mm-hmm. right? What would you tell her? Well, I think to trust myself. So I think that that was a really, because kind of your heart knows, I feel like. Mm -hmm. So I think in those times when maybe things were hard to really trust myself and what, what, what I was doing or what we were doing in, in our business, um, to share the burden, I think to share the burden, I think, um, it can be really, it can be really hard to do it all on your own and without support. And when you're in those leadership roles, I think it can, you can sort of get in that place where you take it all on. And if you share the burden, I mean, it just, it's, you know, if you've surrounded yourself with, with good people, good partners, then sharing the burden is really important. Yeah. And whether that's, you know, maybe you don't have a business partner, but just being able to talk to someone or vent or emotionally share the burden, I think is huge. Yes. And I think um, take care of yourself and continue to learn. So really, you know, probably wasn't as um, health conscious, you know, when I was younger. Mm Mm-hmm. And and probably didn't spend as much time sort of educating myself. Like take advantage of there's always so much educational opportunity around. And so I think when we got into a place where we were really taking advantage of that, um, it is beneficial. If you, you know, you sit through a one hour seminar, maybe you only learn one thing, but you learned one thing new. Yeah. And so you get to keep that. And you can find a place to use it. So I think the educational, the growing your education and continuing to, you know, sort of invest in yourself. I know it's kind of cliche, but I think that that's, that's important. Yeah. And it's, as you said, it only takes one thing. Extreme ownership was transformational for you guys. Totally. I can't wait for you. To I, I'm, I'm extremely excited to get the book and, and start reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot. You've been very gracious with your time. Is there anything that we haven't covered? that you think would be particularly funny, useful, helpful, enjoyable for our listeners as they continue to pursue their entrepreneurial passions, they think about pursuing their entrepreneurial passions, or any other advice that you want to share? And I'm trying to think, was there one thing that I thought, oh, I got to make sure I tell Andrew this, but um, (laughs) I don't know. I feel like we've covered a lot. We've covered so much. Hopefully we haven't bounced around too much. No, I, I, I think what I... The car industry, as you've described it, I think has opened up just naturally so many different elements that are key to so many industries. Mm -hmm. And the one piece that in the car industry that we didn't really talk a ton about, we talked about having a positive banking relationship, but it's a tough capital industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, floor plans, you know, having multi-million dollar floor plan inventory. And for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with what that is, Basically, all of those cars that are on a dealership's lot are pretty much financed. It's mm-hmm. called a floor plan. And then yeah. you have to submit something to the bank every... But that type of leverage, and maybe that's what my last question would be to you. You're talking staggering amounts of money and leverage and debt. Think about think about it how it is now with the way interest rates are. So you think about it when it was, you know, even, you know, four or five years ago versus what it is now, the amount of, so how that has to, how you have to adjust your business. So you, the amount of inventory that you have Mm -hmm. available for people to sort of shop from the shelf 
you know, can really vary across dealerships based on, you know, those relationships, how much cash you have, yeah. you know, that whole goes back to the cash is king thing with mm-hmm. my dad. I mean, that is a really, cause the bank is always going to give you more money if you have more money. Yeah. I don't know why it works that way. <laughs> it's always really kind of frustrating, but that's a thing, right? Uh, but they want their share. if you have share. no money, they're not going to give you any. <laughs> So just, that's a thing. (laughs) That's that's a thing. That's a great point. (laughs) I guess on that ending note, uh, interest rates. We've seen the economy. You've seen the ups and downs of the early 80s, the 90s, 2000, 2010, um, COVID. Where do you see us economically speaking? This is more of a fun personal question in terms of where we sit from you know, so many people are trying to decide, do I buy a house? Do I not buy a house? Mm -hmm. For business owners, they're trying to think, do I pay down all my debt because interest rates are so high and just wait and see what happens? Do I, I mean, we're seeing this at every level of business, at every level of entity. From what you've learned in such a volatile industry, where, how do you see things? And maybe you talk with your brother, Scott, about this because he's still very much in the car business. And so this is a very relevant topic of conversation from him. Give us your you know, 30,000 foot view on where you see the economy and from a, a business owner, capital perspective, capital stack, how, what your opinion is there advice? Well, like you said, the business changes so fast. So I've been out of it now for, you know, a year and a half going on two years. And it's, it's even in that short period of time. And obviously because we had COVID and then, you know, the last couple of years, you know, it's changed so much that I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to know, but going back to what I was just saying, that cash piece is, um, I, I think, you know, if, if you have cash and you're able to sort of take, take, uh, take advantage of the interest rates in your favor versus being so extended, Mm -hmm. you know, business people that are, that are more on that side are, are, you know, obviously going to benefit. Yeah. Um, because I don't think we, I don't think we know what's going to happen. I mean, hopefully come, you know, after the first of the year, maybe this time next year, hopefully we will be in a better position. I mean, I think that sort of seems to be what things are pointing towards, but how much better I think is the real question, right? How much, how much, how much better will it be? Yeah. Um, how much lower could those rates potentially get? When we're, because it's all relative, right? We're comparing it to when they were, you know, if you're talking about a mortgage or a car loan, you're talking, you know, just those sort of three you know, percent, three and, and a and, quarter, right? Which historically you know? is just astronomically low, right? I mean, we've just been spoiled for the last 12 but we're, that's years. what we're, you know, that's what we're used to now, yeah, yeah. right? So expectations dealing, are everything, yeah. And so it, it's a really, it, it's, it's the, the relative piece of that, but. Yeah. So I don't, I mean, you know, I'm as, I'm as confounded as, as the next, especially since I'm, you know, I'm not in it every single day. Yeah. Um, but I do think, you know, just in talking with Scott, I mean, cash is king having that cash, because I think it is when, when you're in a place like that, um, one of the things that Scott and I used to talk about, if we thought we needed capital, it was always important to go after that capital when you, when you didn't need it. Yeah. So when that's you, a great you, point. you, if you, you, because the, it's going to be a lot harder to, you know, have access to those funds. If you're in a place where you're like, Oh, really desperate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because the, the banks don't, don't like that. And we've seen that historically speaking. Yeah. I mean, that's just a, it's just sort of a principle of business. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's always hard to think about too, because if you don't need it, you're like, well, do you really, do you want to borrow? I mean, who's trying to borrow money at whatever, 7%, right? But yeah. if it's 13% and you borrowed it at seven, you're going to look really smart, yep, that's right? Exactly so, right? Yeah. Shannon, thank you so much for spending so much time with us and for all of your advice and wisdom. It's so greatly appreciated. Oh my gosh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all the time that we have for today's episode of the Andrew Holland Podcast. We're so thankful that Shannon joined us. Remember, you can catch all of our podcasts on your favorite audio platforms, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Andrew Holland Podcast, and follow us on Twitter. My thread is A Holland Podcast. Same thing on threads. Thank you so much for joining us this week. 
Have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk again next Wednesday. Thank you for listening to the Andrew Holland Podcast. Be sure to visit our website, theandrewhollandpodcast.com, for additional content on business, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Andrew Holland Podcast, to get notifications when new podcasts have been released. And lastly, follow us on Twitter, A Holland Podcast. That's A Holland Podcast for all the conversations we're having outside the podcast. Thanks again so much for joining us this week. Have a great day, and we'll talk again next week.